Ladies and gentlemen, you live in a weird day where churches are doing unbelievable things in the name of God. It's almost like the Christian religion has evolved into a monster, and it's not what it used to be. And I think the church today, many of them are so off base that some of them should probably not call themselves Christians anymore. And so what caused this drift? Where did all this start? Well, I'm going to give you this, and it all started with one sermon that was preached years ago, and I'm going to give you the sermon that derailed American Christianity. Now, in order to understand this scenario, you have to just start way back at the beginning of the 20th century. So, in 1905, you basically have three groups of people in America calling themselves Christians. You have the Catholic folks. Popery was what it was called back in the, that day. And then you have the Protestants, and they were the ones who came out of Catholicism and the Reformation. And they largely called themselves evangelicals. But they're not the evangelicals of today. This is not the same crowd. And this crowd made up all of your Anglicans, your Episcopals, your Presbyterians, Reformed, Methodists, and Congregations. All of these folks largely uh, called themselves Evangelical Protestants. And, and these people fellowshiped with each other. And then you had another crowd calling themselves the Baptists. Now the ba Baptists never were Protestant. They never came out of the Catholic Church. And so they're basically over here on their own. Now three big names to keep in mind around this time in, a, in church history. Uh, the first big one you got to realize is a man named Evan Roberts. Now, Evan Roberts was the firebrand of the Welch Revival over in Wales. Uh, Evan Roberts was used of God. He was about 26 years old when the revival started. And that revival spread all through Wales. It spread all the way into France, into Germany, uh, into Spain, into England. And even in, in 1905, it came across to the United States of America, uh, Pennsylvania, Canada. It was going all through Atlanta, through New York. And, and churches of these times, of, of all of these denominations here, the Baptists and the Protestants, all of these churches were experiencing revival in 1905 and literally thousands of people were being added to church rolls every year and all the documents and records of church attendance prove that. Well, all that started with Evan Roberts in 1904, 1905, somewhere in that time range with the Welch Revival. Also, Billy Sunday... was a Presbyterian evangelist going around preaching, uh, preaching against liquor. He was actually a, a professional baseball player that was converted. I believe he played for Pittsburgh. He was converted through a service at the YMCA and uh, ended up being a preacher, preaching against uh, everything he could think of, especially liquor and preaching the gospel. He saw hundreds of thousands of people saved. And another big name to know at 1905 was a man named Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham was a Baptist preacher from Kentucky. He's actually buried in Louisville, and he was going around preaching all kinds of evangelistic meetings. Mordecai Ham is significant because he was the evangelist that preached that got Billy Graham saved as a young man. So 1905, this is the picture. This is the layout of the religious scenes in the United States of America at this time. So that being the case, we'll move from 1905 to 1922, and this is the sermon that derailed everything. This sent the Christian world into total chaos. 1922, Harry Emerson Fosdick, a Baptist preacher preaching at a Presbyterian church where he was the pastor, preached a sermon on May 21st, 1922 in Manhattan, New York called Shall the Fundamentalist Win? Now, a fundamentalist at this time was defined by doctrinal positions. 
these physicians were. They believed in the inspiration of the Scriptures, that the, the Bible was not written by man. God gave the Bible. Uh, the virgin birth of Christ and the blood atonement of Christ, the second coming of Christ, and the deity of Christ. Fosdick says that these doctrinal positions, and in the sermon he actually dealt with four of them, he said these fundamentals should not define Christianity. He said Christianity cannot be bound by these doctrinal implications. Basically, what he said was, there are people out there who do not believe in the virgin birth of Christ, and they are Christians. Let me translate that for you. There were people at the time who were saying that the Virgin Mary was a prostitute, and that Jesus Christ was the son of a prostitute and a Roman soldier. That's what these, these people were preaching at this time, and they were called modernists. And they denied almost all of these doctrinal positions. They didn't believe that Jesus was coming back anytime soon. Uh, they, they believed in a work salvation. They denied the blood atonement. Uh, they denied all those things. And by the way, Martin Luther King was, was a modernist. He denied this stuff too. Harry Emerson Fosdick preached that message called Shall the Fundamentalist Win? And he he absolutely sent the, the Protestant denominations into a tailspin, especially the Presbyterian denomination. Now there was a voice that stepped forward by the name of Macon. Mr. Macon preached against Mr. Fosdick and actually said, we are not going to let this man take over this denomination. We are fundamentalists. We are Bible believers. We hold to these doctrinal positions here, and we're not going to let guys like Fosdick, who are heretics, take over this denomination. And basically, the fuss was so big and the fight was so large that basically what Fosdick did is he took all of these Protestant denominations and he split them right down the middle. And he split this crowd into two categories. Let me give you what they were. The modernist and the fundamentalist. Mr. Macon came forward and says, we're, we're staying here. Mr. Fosdick created a new category right there and split all of the Protestant denominations right down the middle. That was the sermon that sent everything into a tailspin. And now instead of having three categories, you now have four categories. And I'm going to throw my conspiracy friends a bone here real quick, but during this time there was a man that was watching Mr. Fosdick and that sermon actually cost Mr. Fosdick his church in the Presbyterian denomination. And a businessman came forward and says, I love that sermon. I love what you stand for. I love that you're attacking these doctrinal positions. I don't hold to them either. I'm going to give a bunch of money and build you a church and you go pastor it. I'm just going to write a check and pay for it. The man who did that was named John D. Rockefeller. Does any of that sound familiar to you? And so in the 1920s, right after World War I, you have four major groups. You have the Catholics, the Modernists, the Fundamentalists, and the Baptists all of them calling themselves Christians in the United States of America. Now the third step that happened, we have 1905, the Welch Revival, we have 1922, the sermon that derailed American Christianity. 
with Harry Emerson Fosdick preaching Shout the Fundamentalist Win. And then it, let's fast forward to 1947. This is where it all takes place today. It all comes together. In 1947, a man wrote a book called The Uneasy Conscience of the Modern Fundamentalist. And that man's name was Carl Henry. He had a contemporary in his day that was called Harold Ockingay. These two men working together, they were not really fundamentalists, but they really weren't modernists either. And they kind of thought, you know, we definitely, we're not this, but we're not this, and we really don't like these guys either, so we gotta, you know, we don't really fit in any of these four categories right here, so let's start an association and let's create a new name, and it was called the Neo-Evangelical. And these people, they uh, started the association called the NAE, National Association of Evangelicals. And the thing with these guys was is that they thought, well, you know, we like the intellectualism of these guys. I mean, these guys believe in science, and, and we, we, want, we want the intellectualism because these guys, you know, these are just country farmers over here who just, they just, you know, when the Bible says Jesus was born of a virgin, they just accept it. They don't, they don't go back and look at the science behind it, see if that was possible. So we like the intellectualism of this crowd. We don't really like the, uh, the lack of intelligence that's over here. We're we're, we're kind of we're kind of we we kind of believe like these guys in a sense, but we're not dumb like these guys are. We 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 and we're not really as separated. You know these guys are just you know they're just in their little country churches just preaching that the blood of Jesus will save you. You know we're okay with that, but we we want to really we think there's more to it. We want to study a little bit deeper than that. And so basically they ended up creating a fifth category called the neo-evangelical and uh, that's what they were because they weren't like the old evangelicals that were here they're not like these guys i mean they weren't uh, they weren't like bb warfield and they weren't like jonathan edwards and george george whitfield they weren't like those guys they weren't like billy sunday you know they were evangelicals but we're the we're the new evangelicals and so today that word neo has just been taken off and now this crowd right here are just referred to today as evangelicals. And that's what they've had that name ever since. And by the way, the figurehead of this movement was a big, big name that everybody knows. He was the disciple of Carl Henry and Harold Ockengay, and his name was Billy Graham. And these men, these evangelical men said, you know, let, these three guys here, they thought, you know, this whole split that they have is ridiculous. Let's try it. Let's, this, this thing has gone this way. Let's do our very best to try to bring it all back together. And so what they've done is they have tried to draw a circle of fellowship right here and they try to get just a little bit of the Catholics in there. They want a fellowship with the modernists and they're always trying to reach out just a little bit to the fundamentalists for those who will at least have something to do with them. And their goal here, these men's goal here, is to try to bring all of this back together and unite everybody as one. And in order to do that, you have to bypass doctrinal issues like the blood atonement, the deity of Christ. You, you, to, in order to fellowship with these guys, we know that these guys right here, they don't believe that Jesus physically rose from the dead, but we're willing to overlook that for the sake of fellowship and for the sake of unity. We're willing to sacrifice doctrine in the name of unity. And so we're going to try to bring all this back together. And ladies and gentlemen, 
that's where we are today. This and this are poison. And these things are uniting with this and even spilling over into this. And by the way, this category right here is getting smaller and smaller every year as more and more people hop the fence and go into this category and fellowship with this crowd here. All of this, all of this right here is going to congeal into one and become your one world religion. And the easiest way to spot this and the easiest way to identify these crowd is to just look at the music that they use. They all use the same music. Michael W. Smith's Your Casting Crowns, uh, your Lauren Daigle, I'd put her probably right there. I'd put Hillsong and Bethel and all them here. And uh, and by the way, this crowd, if, if you'll notice them, the evangelicals here, they don't, their heroes are not preachers. Their heroes are football stars and rock stars and NASCAR racers and movie stars. That's who these people's heroes are right here. And all of this, it used to just be Catholics, it used to be Protestant people, it used to be the Baptists, that was the three crowds. Everybody knew these people weren't Christians right here. So it used to be these two and this. But now, through compromise and through merging of doctrinal positions, you have this. This five categories now. This is where we are today. The reason the church of today is so worldly and so weak is because it has assimilated these two into the pile. It has assimilated Catholicism and modernistic theology. It has assimilated unbelief into the pile of belief. And this is what most of your churches are today. This is what most of your non-denominationals are. This is what all your contemporary stuff is. This is where all your Rick Warren, your purpose-driven stuff is. This is where all your compromising churches are. This is where all your worldly churches are. This is the crowd right here that came to fruition as a result of that one sermon in 1922 preached by Harry Emerson Fosdick. This was the event that set all of this in motion. And now you have Christian crack houses, you have Christian nightclubs, you have Christian alcohol, and the reason they got all that is because they tried to merge this and all this together, trying to merge holy and unholy, trying to merge unbelief with belief, trying to merge bad theology 
with good theology and it never will work. It never has worked. And that's basically where we are today, ladies and gentlemen. And it all goes back to an infidel named Harry Emerson Fosdick who did not believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Scary stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time that you awaken to these things and realize that you need to come out of this. And I think if you're in this, you need to take a gigantic step that way and realize if you're in this and you fellowship with this and your kids get a hold of this and your grandkids get a hold of this, don't be surprised if they grow up to be infidels like Harry Emerson Fosdick. And don't be surprised if it, at the Thanksgiving dinner table someday down the road, they tell you they don't believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. How could that happen? Well, you were in this crowd, and this crowd fellowship with that crowd, and that crowd fellowship with that crowd, and all of this there is coming together, so you better get out of this. You better run from this as quick as you can. And everybody needs to take a step back to the right, because this is where belief is. This is where Bible-believing Christianity is. Anything to the left of that is a fraud. And come out from among her and be separate, saith the Lord.